everyone, I'm Jennifer, and today I'm going to talk about data analysis in wearable technology. Okay, uh, first I want to introduce myself. I now work in a middle-sized hospital in Taipei, and now I'm in residency training in family medicine. And in our hospital, uh, we are having a cloud project uh, cooperated with the university laboratory. Uh, we, the goal is to provide automatic health management. So uh, we develop hardware, platform, and service in order to, uh, to create a low-cost and easy-to-use system that uh, can let pa patients can measure their blood pressure or blood sugar at home, and there's no need to input or upload anything. They only have to measure. Mm -hmm. And it's all automatic uh, done, and the interpretation is also automatic. And we give it a periodical monitoring about measurement data and usage metadata. And outside the hospital, I'm also an amateur runner and cyclist. I attend to some marathons and uh, road biking activities. Okay. So for doctors, numbers are really important. When you come to an uh, emergency room, the first thing a nurse will do is to check your body temperature, pulse rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. Sometimes also oxygen saturation. We call it vital signs. If a patient is hospitalized, their vital signs are recorded many times per, per day. And if uh, he or she is in serious condition, we will uh, use a continuous monitor to uh, check their vital signs. But if you are not in a hospital, and you, um, if you also want to check these numbers, how can you, you do this? Uh, in 2007, um, Wired Magazine, it is said that there's a trend to find clever ways to extract streams of numbers from ordinary human activities. And uh, this is the uh, start of a movement called Quantified Self. The key point of Quantified Self movement is uh, self-knowledge through numbers. And to do this, um, in participant record their daily activities. What kind of daily activities do they record? Well, basically, it's everything I can think of. From uh, how many hours they sleep, um, how many cups of coffee they, t they drink a day, the steps, or how much workout they do. Anything they can think of, I will try to record it. And there's our uh, hundreds of groups um, all around the world, and there's annual and monthly quantify self meetups uh, in which the participant will share their experience about uh, which, which data they want to record and what they learn from it. Okay. So uh, in these years, wearable devices are really popular in market, such as pedometer, activity tracker, fitness wristband or smartphone and smartwatch. What, uh, the, what's the difference between these wearable devices uh, claiming they are promoting uh, people's health? What's the uh, connection between these devices to our daily clinical practice? I'm really curious about this, so that's why I'm giving this talk. Well, they all claim uh, different features. Uh, some devices check your, um, check your steps, maybe they, they uh, record your sleeves, your daily activities. But most of them have only uh, a few common functions. One is activity monitor, and another one is heart rate monitor. So uh, today I'm going to focus, uh, uh, focus on these two, uh, these two features. Um, what can wearables do? As we know that they uh, give users self-knowledge and establish some motivations. Um, what I uh, think is important that it gives a, a create a create an environment that the users can continuously recording their daily lives and have long-term data. 
which is very rare in non-medical settings. Although a report show that one third of the users stop using their wearable devices within six months, the rest of the users are still generate more and more data every day. So let's talk about um, data accessibility. You, uh, when using this um, wearable device, can you, you get uh, the data you need? Most, uh, most users uh, access their data and receive reports through applications or web services. And sometimes the vendors may uh, provide an API so you can easily extract the data. But sometimes there is no API or any export functionality. For example, Fitbit is a really famous um, fitness uh, wristband, and it provides a Python API for users. And in addition, Joe Bong, um, uh, it looks like this, Joe Bong is also providing users some Python wrapper for the API. So if they uh, provide this kind of API, then we can uh, have our data easily. But um, most of the time, it's really hard to get the raw data of the sensors. Okay. So now I want to talk about the activity monitor. Um, when there's no uh, electronics, when uh, in a long time before, when people want to record their steps, they use a kind of machine like this. It's a small device, they attach this on their uh, feet and use a string to add, add one end on this device and the other end is on their uh, left hand. And so every time when they make a step, the string was pulled and this, uh, this machine will move forward one step and you can see directly from other side how, mu how many steps they took. And um, more recently, the pedal meter uh, is really, uh, really popular when I was a kid. This kind of machine uh, is, by, uh, is using um, a pendulum, pendulum system. But nowadays, most of the activity trackers using a accelerometer. And what is a accelerometer? It detects linear acceleration. In other words, that is how fast uh, it moves. You can imagine that the uh, accelerometer like a ball floating in a box. When there's an acceleration like this uh, to our left, the ball will hit the uh, right side walls. And because this wall is made of some piezoelectric material, that means the um, voltage output will be different, uh, will change with the pressure on it. So the harder the ball pr push the walls, the larger uh, voltage will be. So by this kind of me mechanism, the acceleration can be recorded. It also can record gravitation force. And when the device is not in stride orientation, like this picture, the ball will, uh, pu uh, will push both x and z axis wall. And you can get the overall acceleration by uh, sum up the acceleration data from uh, these two sides. Uh, in addition, uh, in activity, tra activity um, trackers, there are also gyroscope. Uh, gyroscope measure orientation and angular speed. So with these two, uh, two sensors, accelerometer and gyroscope, one can initially um, determine which side is downward and uh, detect gravitation force. And when the device is tilted, you can track its movement by gyroscope and to uh, substrate the gravitation force and get the net acceleration for the, uh, the device. Okay. So the raw data of activity trackers will look like this. There are some uh, timestamps and uh, accelerate, uh, accelerator and gyroscope data in 
each axis. So we, uh, now we know what uh, activity tracker data will look like. How can we measure a step? This is data from an uh, accelerometer um, mounted on waist, maybe on a, a, bed, uh, a belt. You can see that because it is a waist accelerometer, the orientation is stable. And all three axes has a stable and beautiful waveform. And if you have an adequate sampling rate, for example, 20 to 30 hertz, then a step is uh, just a peak over the threshold you choose. Like if you uh, choose a threshold like this, then every this uh, peak is a step. But now some, some wristband also calculate, also calculate your steps. So I also want to compare the wrist and waist accelerometer. For wrist accelerometer, uh, you wear this on your, uh, on your hands. It cannot measure steps accurately. And sometimes it misrecognizes arm activity as steps. So in lab settings, the wrist accelerometer uh, will have fewer steps count, but in uh, everyday life, it will have a, a more a, a higher activity, a higher steps count. So in other hand, waist accelerometer detects steps accurately, but it is uh, less convenient to interact with. So uh, this chart shows uh, how many steps. Uh, per day is recommended for people in different ages and different sex. Like for adults between 20 to 65 years old, it is recommended to take more than 7,000 steps per day. And uh, on the uh, column, on this column, it says that at least 15,000 steps per week um, is recommended in a moderate uh, moderate to vigorous activity. So can a wrist, uh, wrist accelerometer also distinguish different kind of activity? The answer is yes. Uh, uh, there's a research show that with only a wrist or ankle worn accelerometer, it can use SVM to distinguish four, uh, different, kind, uh, four different categories of physical activity which is ambulation, sedentary, cycling, and other activity. And it can use 95% uh, accuracy to use only one accelerometer and to distinguish different kinds of activity. This is important because we, uh, the um, energy expenditure or calorie you burn every day is depends on um, how, uh, what the intensity of the activity you take. Uh, activity, physical activity index in a day will look like this. You can uh, see that when you are sleeping, it is no, um, not so much physical activity, and in daytime, it is varies a lot. Then I want to uh, talk about heart rate monitor. There are two main methods to detect your heart rate. The uh, most um, Popular one is electrocardiogram, or ECG. It detects the tiny electrical changes on the skin through these electrodes. And ECG will generate waveform looks like this. Uh, it has different components, like P wave and QRS component and T wave. And different components have its uh, own physiological meaning. And the heart rate is by extracting the R wave in the ECG wave. You can see that R wave is really sharp and it's easy to t distinguish from the other part of the wave. Okay, the other method to check your heart rate is through photoplethysmogram or PPG. Uh, photo means light and plethysmogram means a measurement of volume. So. Uh, in PPG, there's a light and a light sensor on different parts of the device. And in each cardiac cycle, when the heart pumps up the blood, the pressure 
will distend the arteries, and light absorbed by the arteries varies in each cycle. So the uh, light sensors will create a waveform looks like this. And it's like uh, not so uh, uh, not so unique as an ECG wave, but you can see the amplitude are uh, changing. So between these two heart rate acquisition methods, EKG or, uh, or ECG is a standard, uh, both in medical and non-medical non settings. It can detect accurate heart rate by extract our peak. And the PPG only can only detect average heart rate, and it is prone to artifacts like motion, pressure, or light. So you can see like in a traditional device for PPG, you have to use a clip to clip it on your, uh, on your finger to make the position and the pressure stable. So by knowing your heart rate, you can now uh, check this um, this table, and there are different in different age. There are different maximum heart rate and target heart rate zone. So when an athlete is trying to uh, have some training, they will have to focus on their heart rate in order to stay in the aerobic exercise zone. So when we mentioned that the EC, uh, ECG or EKG is more accurate. So for runners and athletes, they used to use this heart rate strap. And it detects e ECG signals. And they can check their uh, current heart rate from a sport watch. So besides uh, heart rate, we also want to know the heart rate variability. What is heart rate variability? That is the uh, oscillation or the tendency of change of each uh, RR intervals. It reveals the state of autonomic nerve system, or ANS. This autonomic nerve system can up or down regulate sympathetic and parasympathetic tone, depending on the needs of the body. So when the body is in a fight or flight situation, the sympathetic tone will rise, and uh, and uh, people can react to some uh, re react to the risk of environment. But it also make the, make people uh, relax when it's needed. And HRV is now known related to cardiovascular mortality, um, for example, sudden cardiac death. The study of heart rate variability starts from fetal monitor. Uh, even now, when a woman is pregnant, every time she receives a prenatal examination, uh, she used to, uh, she have to receive this external fetal monitor. There are two parts of it. One is an ECG lead, which records the baby's heartbeat. And the other part is a, uh, a pressure sensor, which records the contraction of uterus. So a doctor will check these two signal. The, uh, this line is the baby's heartbeat, and the y-axis is uh, um, the heart rate of the ba uh, of baby. And this line in case the contraction of uterus. So when it has the pressure is higher, it looks like this. And in this. Uh, in this patient, you can see there's a regular contraction of her uterus. So if baby's heart, uh, if baby's in good situation, it, uh, its heartbeat should be, have, uh, should be with a higher variability, or, or we call it reactive. And doctors will also check the interaction between the baby's heartbeat and uterus contraction. If there are abnormal deceleration, and maybe mean the baby is in bad situation and need to get out as soon as possible. So that's for a fetal monitor. But for uh, normal, uh, for adults, we use the term NN in place of RR to emphasize the fact that the process uh, beats are normal beats. There are many 
uh, time domain and frequency domain measures we can use on uh, hardware variability. For example, in time domain measures, we can check the uh, SDNN or standard deviation of NN in milliseconds. Or SDANN, which is uh, standard deviation of the average NN intervals for five minutes intervals in 24 hours. Or like PNN50, that means the percentage of NN intervals uh, which has um, more than 50 milliseconds difference from prior interval. And so RMSSD, that means root mean square of differences between successive NN intervals. And for uh, time fre uh, frequency domain measures, can uh, check different frequency, like ultra low frequency power or very low frequency power. Uh, most important is uh, low frequency and high frequency power, or LF and HF. LF means the uh, sympathetic tone, and HF means the uh, uh, parasympathetic tone of the patient. And the LF and HF ratio indicates the balance of this patient's autonomic nerve system. So it all sounds really complicated, but we have a Python uh, library to compute this for us. Like with uh, PyHRV, you, uh, you can just do all the, uh, the calculation for you. The input of this library is a time ascending list of interbit interval. And it will generate uh, uh, like those measures we mentioned, like uh, PN50 or RMSSD. Okay. So what can HRV tell us? A uh, decreased HRV, is, uh, in addition to uh, for a sign of um, heart rate, uh, cardiovascular risk. It also means for some uh, athletes, it means overtraining and poor sleep quality. For uh, sleep quality, you can see the, uh, a normal sleep cycle. We have, uh, um, when we are asleep, there are different stages of sleep, uh, from awakening to light sleep to deep sleep, and it will change up and down. In the deep sleep, the heart rate and the physical activity is, uh, is going down, and in light, um, in light sleep, it is going up. So when people have uh, sleep disorder or poor sleep quality, uh, they may have some symptoms, like they feel really sleepy during the day, they have trouble falling or staying asleep, uh, they stated that it's snoring light, uh, in nights, and they stop breathing briefly and often while asleep. Or they say they have uncomfortable feelings uh, in legs and the urge to move them. All these different symptoms indicate different kinds of sleep disorder. So, uh, well, in hospital, the standard sleep, uh, standard check for uh, sleep disorder is through polysomnography. That means you have to sleep in hospital for a night and let all these sensors and wires around you. A doctor will check your uh, brain waves, heart rate, oxygen level, breathing rate, and eye and leg movement. Now we know that most of these sensors have a wearable, uh, a wearable version. So maybe in the future, uh, when a patient has a sleep disorder, they can, uh, can self-diagnose at home by, uh, have, and have their own polysomnography. Well, um, and finally, I want to share you about some uh, our experience in blood pressure control. This is a patient's uh, blood pressure data uh, last year. Because uh, she's in, uh, included in our cloud project, she um, recorded her blood pressure every day at home. And we apply Hilbert Huang transformation on her blood pressure data to see the tendency of uh, its blood pressure. You can see that her blood pressure going down in May or June and going up again at the end of the year. Then my indicates that this patient's blood 
pressure is sensitive to weather change. So next year, we can uh, adjust her drug dose of hypertension drug uh, before the weather goes really cold. And the uh, uh, Hilbert-Huang transformation, or HRT, I also have a library to, to do. Okay, um, for a quick recap um, about data analysis in wearable technology, uh, we measure acti uh, have activity monitor, heart rate monitor, like ECG and PPG, and we can uh, check its heart rate variability, and there's also BP monitor. So, uh, with all this wearable technology, uh, may we all live long and prosper. <laughs> Thank you very much. So are there any questions? Excuse me, uh, you were saying that... Uh, uh, 对不起,可以用中文吗?刚刚那个睡眠的那个监测里头,你有提到说我的器材都是有限的,那不知道为什么没有人去把所有东西去 <笑> 我这种东西有就是各种医疗器材 所以说不是自己，就是自己说是医疗器材就可以是医疗器材这样子。对，你在HHT里面只看到长期的趋趋势，对，还有其你没有收其他的短周期，对，就是其实它这个不同的周期在不同的那个，就是从大的周期跟小
or some information technology background. So um, we have to, um, I have to cooperate with uh, someone who having this background and uh, what we can do is to provide our clinical knowledge and try to indicate the findings in data and uh, um, the diagnosis or the uh, clinical situation. Um, what you were describing sounds pretty similar uh, to the conventional collaboration between medical and other in the engineering practices. And do you think uh, uh, how would Python uh, play in a role in this kind of collaboration? Uh, I think Python is a really easy to use language. So um, if um, more doctors can have the ability to, to use this language, then we can um, uh, maybe just write, uh, just to create the software by, by ourselves. Yeah. That is it. Answer your question. Hi, uh, hi Jennifer. Okay, can I, oh. okay, I can speak first. Sorry. Uh, thanks for your, your talk. You surprised me in some sort of good way for this talk. <laughs> I didn't expect this kind of talk. So um, I'd like to extend the Yong Yi's question. Uh, if the, this kind of healthy wearable device and uh, analysis is really a trend in like near 10 years. So uh, supposedly there should be some sort of computing to associate with that, right? So for example, we can use Python and other kind of stuff. So as the, according to your survey, because you are also in a, some sort of uh, institution, what can we do as a Python developer or as a Python community to jump into that trend such that in near future 10 years, Python has a really good cooperation with this kind of uh, wearable uh, computing or analysis. So it's a quite big problem, a uh, quick question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think for, for, for my, myself, I, uh, I wish I can have uh, more um, opportunity to, to play with data. Thing, yeah, to uh, get fam familiar with these data processing tools and maybe like um, and take some course of like um, digital signal processing. I think it's really important to this. <coughs> I, I don't know whether <laughs> answer your question. It's too short. Cool, yeah. Hello. Um, thank you for that um, interesting presentation you did. Um, back in my research lab, we also have some studies related to what you're doing here. And because it's related to a matter of life and death, it's so interesting. Uh, <coughs> uh, I have a question uh, related to the type of analysis you're doing. Uh, um, I wanted to know uh, how doable it is to create a real-time system, because this is a component that is missing, I think, right now. Uh, to create a real-time analysis, that would be, I think, uh, like a killer feature or something for some for some kind of data like this. Yes, uh, for real-time real-time analysis is, is really important. Well, in our uh, in our project, that the um, the EKG signals we can detect some severe arrhythmia pattern in EKG this uh, EKG signals like. Uh, ventricular, uh, uh, ven ventricular tachycardia or uh, ventricular fibrillation. Yeah, there's only some um, we detect em emergent, emergent situation, and most of what we do is uh, uh, focus on the long-term data processing. And okay, uh, the reason I ask is because do you guys have like a system in place where you would probably, if you have a patient that you know is, is suffering from something, you know, like a, like a cardiovascular or something, problem with their muscles or problem with their heart or something, do you have a system where you can notify or alert someone that uh, this is occurring or how, what's, what action is taken? Uh, we'll send, uh, SM, uh, we'll send uh, SMS or emails to uh, their, um, uh, to their con contactor, yeah. 
Okay, so this is already present already. Is this happening already? Yeah, there is. Um, um, I think for now. Uh, for now, we send messages if they uh, don't record, uh, don't measure their blood pressure for many days. We will send the message, not um, instant or real time processing. Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, I want to ask a question about the HHT transformation. Uh, as because we already know that the heart rate variability can be uh, proved to be associated with clinical outcome, uh, I'm curious that if if there any study have proved that the HHT is correlated with the clinical outcome, including the cardiovascular disease or other uh, 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 diverse outcome. Thank you. Mm, well, I'm not sure about this. I have to look. Look it up. So, so are there more more questions? Okay, if no questions, then we let's thank speakers again.